Yo, have you heard of LinkedIn Learning? If you haven't, LinkedIn Learning is an American massive open online course provider. It provides video courses taught by industry experts in a variety of subjects. Now, why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this because Living Corporate is in partnership with LinkedIn Learning to provide diversity, equity, and inclusion courses. Listen, if you're trying to be a better ally, you want to understand better diversity, equity, inclusion strategies, or you just want to learn how to be a better leader, you got to check out the courses on LinkedIn Learning. So check it out. You can do it one of two ways. You can click the link in the show notes or you go to LinkedIn Learning and you search Living Corporate again link in the show notes or go to LinkedIn Learning and search Living Corporate. I'll see you over there. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. So glad to have you here. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode, the Thursday edition of The Access Point. We are so excited to have you with us for this evening in our Living Corporate family. Let me tell you a bit about Living Corporate. Living Corporate is a digital media network consultancy focused on workplace equity and inclusion. Living Corporate centers and amplifies black and brown voices in the workplace through digital media production and business to business consulting. The network offers a variety of programming and tonight we're excited that you joined us for the latest installment of the Access Point. This show, the Access Point is a weekly webinar focused on black and brown college students and early career professionals for the workforce, excuse me, early career professionals for the workforce by having the real nuanced talks they need, they know they need, don't know they need. For this Thursday night iteration of our show, we will focus more closely on the real challenges that you, our viewers, are facing as you move through the early stages of your career. So we welcome your stories, experiences, and questions and look forward to equipping you with the strategies to mitigate these challenges. Must offer a disclaimer here. The thoughts and views expressed in tonight's discussion do not reflect the views of any organization with which any of the hosts are affiliated. With that said, let's start with introductions. Always let the ladies go first. Wendy. Hi, I am Dr. Wendy M. Edmonds. I am an author, consultant and assistant professor at Bowie State University, the oldest historically black university in the state of Maryland. And your job is your treasure. I help you to separate the gems from the counterfeit. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Deborah Hunter Johnson. And what I do is help you accelerate your wisdom curve. I tell you what you need to know now so that you can achieve your goals more fully and faster. I'm an attorney by training. I consider myself a workplace consultant. I've worked with large, small companies and have a boatload of wisdom to share this evening on our topic. I appreciate it. I, I need that boatload too. I am Lonnie Morris. I am a management consultant and professor and I spend my time helping working professionals at critical stages in their career unpack organizational issues, uncover the meaning behind them, and develop strategies and resolutions. Two things are really important to me. The first is making the world of work a much better place. And the second is helping you hate your job less. Great. So let's hop right in. All right. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And tonight we pose the question to you, do you have this secret weapon? Well, okay, so before we even reveal the weapon, let's talk about what a secret weapon is and what you need it for. So a secret weapon is someone or something that is given to you to have the advantage over the opponent. So why would you need a secret weapon? or how many of you all <laughs> think about that quite frequently? Well, some of the things that we're hearing about is, is about microaggression. And that can show up in different ways, but let me just share one of my experiences. So early on in my career, I really had um, a wonderful time. I was an administrative assistant for um, the head of the organization for a short time, and then I just kind of moved around. 
we were in a new building. So all the lines were crossed and, you know, the technology didn't quite work. And there were a lot of things that were going on that weren't quite correct. Well, I got called to the president's office and I thought, well, hey, this is really great. Maybe because of the work that I'm doing, here's a way uh, that I'm going to hear about him appreciating my work. Well, I go in and, and it was a whole suite. So we know the suite has a beautiful carpet and the beautiful furniture. You know you're in a different part of the building. And so... Um, as I go into the office and have a seat, the head of the organization proceeds to tell me that there was an, uh, a call that he received that this person overheard a conversation. The conversation was vulgar and the conversation sounded black. Being the only African-American person who was hired in the organization, he began to uh, chastise me, reprimanded me, and only because that person said that the conversation that they heard sounded black. Because I was early in my career, I didn't handle it well. I'm not even going to go into um, the things <laughs> that transpired after that. But I needed a secret weapon. I really needed a secret weapon. So now let's kind of peel that apart and let's talk about some of the things that um, we're experiencing and hearing about as we move along in our um, show tonight. So let's let's hear from you, Deborah. Thanks, Wendy. I can talk about experiences I've had in my career. What I find is that as a person of color, when you're in a role that's focused primarily on technical competency in the early stages of your career, many times people are happy that you're doing the work. And so you often fly under the radar. But as you rise up the ranks and people start realizing you're actually competition to them because they don't naturally see us as competition, that's where you can start having issues. And that's where I started having challenges. I had a boss have a meeting with me to tell me that some of my clients had a negative reaction to me because they felt I was too perfect. And what she counseled me on is that I should make more mistakes. <laughs> and, you know, coming from a family where it was steeped in you, you need to be twice as good. Mm -hmm. That feedback sounded dangerous to me. And I also think that her nomenclature wasn't as refined as it needed to be. Years later, I realized what she was saying is you needed to be more relatable and authentic, but she wanted me to lower my level of excellence to make other people feel better. And that was the message that I heard that I couldn't understand because I could easily be more relatable and accessible to people without lowering my standards. And that was very interesting. And as I continued to move up the ranks, I started getting inconsistent feedback. And that's where you need to really put your radar up. If one person says you're too aggressive, the next person saying you're too passive, one person says you're indifferent, another person says you're always up in everybody's business, <laughs> don't try to twist like a pretzel to respond. You need to think about it and understand what's going on beyond the feedback that you're being given. So that was a really, those were really challenging times, complex times where I needed a secret weapon to help me. That's interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Deborah. I'd say my, my experience was once similar to yours, but a little adjacent. And I was once told that I was working too hard. Right. And so when you come from my background, our backgrounds, where you are accustomed to multitasking, mm -hmm. when you can master multiple skills and apply those simultaneously. So it's pretty easy all of my career for me to manage multiple things. Right. So manage multiple units, manage multiple budgets, and I can have my hands in lots of things and everything moves well and we're successful. But sometimes that is seen as a threat because you begin to build new allies and other departments 
You get close relationships with people who have resources, who are gatekeepers that people in the organization may not have those relationships with. And so my progression to really just opening up the organization so it wasn't so insular just in the space in which I was working, but really to become part of the fabric of what was happening was seen as that's a little too much. You are going beyond the scope of your duties. Not It wasn't a compliment in that you are competent and you are successful and that you are achieving. It was how can you pull back some so you aren't showing out everybody else? Mm-hmm. Those are times when you need a secret weapon to help you understand what's happening and to navigate and to translate what that language is really saying. That's right, because in the moment, it's confusing. Yeah. It's hurtful. Yeah. You don't know who you can talk to about it within the workplace. And many times the people who are giving that feedback are in an exalted role where they control the trajectory of your career. Right. And pushing back or not complying can be dangerous and career limiting for you Mm -hmm. in that organization. So it can really create some cognitive dissonance. I know it did for me. And I'm thinking about diversity. We often say this is what we want in the workplace. This is what we need in the workplace. Research shows that there's more um, success in organizations when they have it. But when you use that word diversity, people tend to think of what? Race. That's the first thing that comes to mind. But what about the way people think, thinking differently? Um, Just like you said, Lonnie, you were seen as being overly aggressive. Well, the same thing with being creative. So being creative can pose a problem because it can look like work to everyone else. You think this is a great idea. You present it as such doesn't mean that it's accepted. And that can be seen as a threat. Then the fun begins. And yes, you need the secret weapon. And Wendy, what you were just talking about is the inclusion side of DEI. People are often fine with the diversity and having it in the room. But when it starts being activated and amplified and actually in the ecosystem, yeah. It feels different to people. And we know studies show different translates into discomfort mm-hmm. for many people. Mm-hmm. And they attribute it to the individual and not the, the fact that it's just different and new. So the person, like in your case, Lonnie, you get the sting, you get the hit yeah. Yeah. for mm-hmm. doing something that's foreign to everybody else's experience. Yeah, so and we, are, we find ourselves in a multi generational workforce, and people come to work for different reasons. And so, what you're doing can look different to everyone at a different point in their career. Absolutely. I'm sorry. No, and, and so what's so important about that is because you think of it from an employee standpoint, where I'm just being myself, I'm just working how I feel comfortable. So, being involved and being engaged. It's how I feel I fit in the space. And so now someone says you're working too hard and you're showing other people out. It makes you feel as if who you are doesn't fit. How you work doesn't fit, even if you're successful. Because this wasn't a conversation about, hey, I want you to reel back in some things because other pieces are not being done well. That was never the conversation. Everything is great, but you're working too hard for us. It's hard to get definable action items out of a broad statement like that. Yeah, absolutely. Which means we probably should talk about what are the larger issues that emanate from that, from these types of conversations, these types of experiences. What are some broad strokes here that we should consider when we're thinking about this as we experience it, as people begin to experience this in their career? Wendy. What does that look like? Is that what you're asking? What does yes, that yes, yes, yes. Yeah, in it, in the workforce, it shows up in so many different ways. Um, one of the things that I experienced in my career was the sudden isolation. Right. This is what you see. It's almost like a form of punishment because of you are working too hard 
and that's not quite the direction that we want to take. That can really create a toxic environment um, when the individuals who have power and authority, when we're looking at the power dominance, can create cliques. Those things, when you look at that, they create a separation among the team in every aspect. So that's the kind of feeling that you're left with, this dilemma. How much of this do I deal with? How do I navigate? Who do I go to in the organization to share? Who do I trust? So you now have to build allies, both inside and outside, and they're determining you know, what your next steps are going to be. So it's an organizational culture issue, it almost, is. right? It mm -hmm. is. When we look at the, the culture of an organization, are they really following the values? Is this the norm? Is Has this been a habit, you know, that this has happened before? These are certain things that we don't always know going into organizations. And then my experience was there was this whole honeymoon period, right? Where you're just feeling a part of the organization. And then this experience takes place. So I like this idea of organizational culture and it's something that comes up for me all the time in my work. Um, and I, I like to link that to what I also see as organizational silence that comes out of that, right? And so the, the types of the issues that you described, Wendy, that you described, Deborah, that I've talked about, people know these things are happening, but often don't speak up about it. So mm -hmm. someone telling me as a black man in the office, that I work too hard, that I'm probably not the first person they've said that to. Mm -hmm. It may have been different language that they use, but they've said to someone else, don't do those things that make us look bad. Don't work the way you feel comfortable because it makes us uncomfortable. And there are multiple ways to think about organizational silence. It really is sort of this collective, it's a collective experience where people sort of hush away from major issues and the things we're describing here are major issues that happen in the organization. You already said it's about organizational culture. So collective means it's systematic, right? People don't speak up about things that have grave concern. Sometimes it can be more of an intentionally being passive. So I just, I won't add my comment to that. I'll let someone else do it. I won't step up. There are some times when the culture is really bad as Wendy described being toxic People are, silence is really a defense mechanism because people are afraid. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that already, Deborah. You don't, if it's your boss and that person controls how you move up in the, in the organization, you don't want to speak back to that person. You don't want to challenge what they've said to you. And there are a few factors I think that become really important when we think about organizational silence. Sometimes it's just a leadership philosophy in that, the managers or senior leaders in the organization fear negative feedback. They don't want to hear it. So people remain silent because they know the bosses don't want to hear this. It might be because they feel that employees are self-interested, right? So somebody telling me I work too hard is almost saying you are arrogant, right? You're showing us out. So stop being so good at what you do. It might be something related to managers think they know best. Um, and this is one I think is really important to consider about this with silence in, in terms of the leadership philosophy is that people mistakenly think that agreement and consensus is a sign of organizational health. Yeah. But we know very well that people are not yeah. speaking up, people are not pushing back, if people are not raising issues, that's a sign of a very unhealthy organization because we're, we've got groupthink now. Two last things I want to mention about this that I think are structural around organizational silence. Central decision-making can lead to that. And so I remember being in an organization where anything I needed to do required six signatures and three vice presidents, <laughs> right? And so I was in a leadership role where I supervised multiple units, multiple budgets, but if I needed to move $100, it required six signatures on a document and three of those had to be from vice presidents from three different divisions. 
So that's a way of controlling how people move resources, how people make decisions. The other one, and this is we find this often in our work, is that there aren't formal mechanisms for feedback that go up. So everything comes down. I can tell you as an employee how you're doing, when you're doing bad, how I think you're working, and what I think you should change. But there's no way for me as an employee to send that information up to people who are above me and above them about how I'm experiencing the workplace. Got it. How about what um, the silence can also take place as a result of having witnessed the sacrificial uh, employee, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. What happened yeah. to that employee that was just like you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. So the silence happens for for different reasons, which is usually what happens in a toxic environment. Uh, I also wanted to uh, share with you, Lonnie, on that same point about how important feedback is. If if communication is only one direction, how do you get feedback? Right. It, it's a form of control. That's interesting. I've never worked in an organization where I could give feedback on my boss ever. Yeah. Not formally. I, 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 I can tell y'all. <laughs> it may not be formal. I, I've not worked where it was formal, but I have worked um, with some, some very good bosses that have asked for that. Yeah. 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 I've, I've been in organizations that have formalized 360 reviews. And what I have found is you have to handle those very carefully because that's where bias comes in. Mm -hmm. Because many times you will find women leaders, leaders of color have lower 360s mm -hmm. because of people's reaction to who they think should be in a leadership role. Yeah. And so sometimes people weaponize the 360 mm -hmm. to show their disapproval mm -hmm. of someone being in a key role. Mm -hmm. So I think the whole feedback loop, the performance management process in organizations are ripe for bias, yeah. discrimination, and they have to be handled well. And the one thing I wanted to throw into the mix on issues and themes you all cover very well, organizational culture is huge, organizational silence, and what plays into both of those are the politics of an organization, yeah. organizational politics. Mm -hmm. And the reality is the world is political. Mm -hmm. But most of us were raised to work hard, keep your nose to the grindstone, and the cream will rise to the top. Yeah. But what we know is that is not always the case mm -hmm. and who you know and how you leverage influence affects your rise in your career. And so you really have to pay attention to the organizational politics. And that goes to your point, Lonnie. How does the institution communicate? Yeah. Because if it's an organization that is steeped in silence, you have to think about the consequences of a more direct style and how do you navigate and get your points across in a way that is more receptive to the organization so that you can get into a leadership role that affects the change. Yeah. And sometimes you have to make that mental calculation. All right, how much do I jump into the politics and lose myself. And everybody has to make that political calculation. But what we know is that the workplace is not a meritocracy. And anyone that goes into it thinking that the great people will always be rewarded, that is not the case. We also know the workplace is subjective. We're subjective people. I and am. so you, right, everybody has subjectivity. So everything doesn't add up nicely on a column and then whatever the highest number is in the column, that's <laughs> the right, the decision. So many other factors come into place, like ability, whether you criticized a project that I had or whether your department told on me about a compliance <laughs> issue. All of those real things talk. that 
you know, are in the underbelly of an organization yeah. factor into politics, whether your boss likes you. Because remember, the, bol- the primary role of a boss is to remove the obstacles for their teams so that they can get their jobs done. So if you have a boss that doesn't like you, they can lean back and not help you remove those obstacles and barriers so that compared to your peers, you look less efficient, less productive, Mm -hmm. you're less able to navigate. And so you have to pay attention to the politics. You yourself, you don't have to become a soulless political animal, but you have to understand how politics factor in. And that is a huge issue in these complicated workplaces that have toxicity and bias in them mm-hmm. how do you navigate and understand the politics you don't have to get caught up in politics. yes exactly mm-hmm. say it again exactly. Wendy. that's it understand the politics but you don't have to get caught up in the politics mm-hmm. absolutely I, I needed that as my suit my my uh secret weapon when i was in the workforce <laughs> Because you just don't know, right? When you're early in your career, it's so nebulous and all these things are so foreign. And most times you feel like, what am I doing wrong? Right. And, and you start to have this guilt because of all these things we talk about. So this culture is a little off. There's this silence because I know somebody else heard him say that to me. <laughs> right. I know someone heard. I know they just saw what came across in that email that was reply all, but no one's speaking up about it. And so your stress level is high. You may begin to feel guilty about it. And as you mentioned, there were sometimes you sort of take on this attitude of, well, let me just go along to get along, which mm-hmm. is different than what we say managing the politics, right? So just say, hey, let me fly under the radar so I don't have any other issues. But that's not always mm-hmm. healthy. No, it's not. It's not. And it's hard because... to bring 100% of yourself to the workplace. Absolutely. So I'd like to talk about my secret weapon. Can I share mine first? Please. All right. So what I have found to be a great secret weapon is curating a personal board of directors. And we all know what a board of directors is, you know, in a publicly held company. These are people who are at the height of their career, the pinnacle of their industry. They're wise. They're sage. And companies pick them to help them set the strategic direction to provide oversight, guidance, and counsel. I think that everyone needs their own personal board of directors that serves in the same role. Why? Because it increases your knowledge base. You don't have to go Google. You don't have to research. You don't have to become an expert in climate change, if you have an issue that you need to know about in your industry, you want to have access to that. You want people who are influential, people who are wise, sage, people of influence who have access. Now, some people, you know, vary from me. I don't think that your best friends are a part of your (laughs) board of directors. This is something that you are creating and building and expanding on that is lifelong. It's a relationship and everybody on there should be wiser than you, smarter than you. You don't want an echo chamber in your personal board of directors. Now, one thing, person you need to have on there is somebody who knows how to negotiate because pretty much everything in life is a negotiation. In the early stages, it's negotiating your salary, your bonuses. But then as you rise up the ranks at stock options, If you're negotiating a real estate deal, you want to make sure you talk to people who know how to leverage positions and they know you well enough to know your strengths and weaknesses. So you need somebody strategic like that, that helps you negotiate and navigate. Right. You also need subject matter experts in your industry that know more than you that have actually achieved things. They're farther along than you are in your career. So they can tell you what the high hills are next. What comes next in this industry? What organizations do I need to be involved in? What people do I need to know? What do I need to be concerned about as I'm building out my skill set for the next three years? You also need somebody who's important and influential 
who can introduce you to the right people. You need somebody who can feed your soul too. There are going to be days where you are crying and you need to have that person. That's not the crack the whip person that one that helps you, you know, get to that next level. Sometimes you need that wise soul that says it's going to be okay. You also need somebody who takes more risk than you do. If your person takes a lot of risk, you might need somebody who's a little bit more prudent. But you want to fill out a board that fills in any area that you need. And it's not transactional. They should not only yeah. hear from you when you need a recommendation for your next job. It is a relationship. So when they ask something of you, it's your number one priority. You keep in touch with them. You are cultivating a lifelong set of advisors and having that will serve you well because many, and you don't, this is another thing. You don't want anybody who is in your place of employment. They do not belong on there because you need to have somebody who is objective and who you feel you can share things with confidentially. Now, here are two questions I think you should consider before thinking about anybody for your personal board of directors. The first question is this, can I trust that the person is acting in good faith and not on some ulterior motive to bring me down a notch? Because you need to be 16. open with them. You have to be willing to share your flaws and tell them what you really said to that person, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you have to feel comfortable that this person, that whatever they say to you, you can receive it with an open heart. So if you don't have that level of trust when you ask yourself that question, that's not somebody who should be on your personal board of directors. The other question is, does this person have some knowledge that I don't have? Okay, because you are trying to expand and amplify your, your knowledge and your wisdom. So those are the two things you want to query when you think about that. And here's the thing. You don't have to go to somebody and say, would you please be on my personal board of directors? You can consider them to be that. And the way you treat them lets them know that they are important to you in their lives. They don't ever have to know you can, that you consider them in that, um, in that place. Yeah. So for me, once I figured that out and started curating people who were wiser than me, that really sort of de-escalated the level of stress. It helped me know, look, if I don't have the right answer right now, I can get it quickly. I can get a plan in place because I already have people convened that can help me solve any problem that I might face, whether it's organizational culture related, organizational silence related, or organizational politics related. I love that. Personal board of directors. Ooh, yes. Now, that. Lonnie, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, you know what, Wendy, I think this one's better for you. So I'm going to ask you this question. Now, there's an online learning platform, does a lot of research, and they said out of several hundred managers they questioned in a recent survey, 66% yeah. of them ranked leadership as the most important skill to develop in their employees. So keeping that in mind, what has been your secret weapon? Do I have to spell it? It's the <laughs> F word. Followership. <laughs> so why 66% say that leadership is important. Uh, the, the leader follower relationship is symbiotic. And so you can't have one sided training and one sided um, investment. Uh huh. So I would say that it has to go both ways meaning that the professional development for uh, career planning is not going to be for leaders most of the time career development are for those who are under leadership so okay I would say my secret weapon is having a career master plan all right, career uh, master plan. Now tell me, tell me what does that look like? A, a, a flexible one. So you know, I remember in um, high school they said you have to have a ten year plan. I thought oh, ten years, I, you know, I, I just uh, 
I was going to do this, 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 and this. And I put that 10-year plan together, looked at it. I was going to follow it. I meant to. I, I had good intentions. And nothing went as planned. But I had a plan. So what we know about our careers is that we should not line them up specifically on a job for a job because there are jobs that change all the time. Industries change, policies change, companies swallow each other up. There's all kinds of things that happen that can change your career plan. But if you have something that you can use as a guide, you're set. Who helps you with that? It is your personal board of directors. And when you are faced with your career plan change for any reason, you have to pivot. Uh, the pandemic has caused pivots for different reasons. You're going to need truth tellers. So when you are seeking your board of directors, who does that look like? And they're, you know, you're recruiting them one by one. Who is it that you can really trust to be open and honest and get that feedback that you are going to have to take and, and, and discern whether or not how much of this can really take and use for the situation that I'm in. So that's the, that's the biggest part that-, that So I Wendy, I have a question. Yeah. On your career master plan, would you actually write it down? All career master plans should be written because okay. you cannot follow it if you can't see it. You cannot measure it if you cannot see it. And you can't how even far tell out that you've moved? How far out do you plan? Do you plan like a year, two years, mm, five years? Mm. So I would say there's two. Okay. There's the long term and the short term. There's the five year. And then there's that one year. The one year is the one that you look at all the time. That's the one that you can look at on a monthly basis. Um, once you have acquired uh, your, uh, your method of how you're going to keep track of your career master plan, you then look at it week by week. How are you moving towards getting to your end goal? And that's how you are measuring it. You cannot have a master plan and never view it, never look at it, mm -hmm. never have it written down. It can be in your head. That's not going to work because there are so many pivots that we deal with today. Just the stock market can change an organization and the direction of the organization. And All right. Those, okay. those are the real um challenges that we're faced with in in the workforce and so that's that's what i um i would say had as a, a a career master plan as the secret weapon all right career master plan so lonnie there was a study done by a leading consulting company and what i liked about it is they surveyed four thousand people that's a pretty big group in four countries and what they concluded is there is increasingly a shift towards valuing human leadership. And it's really crystallized now with the COVID-19 crisis. And now that people expect something different from leaders, a more human approach, most people feel there's no going back. And if you don't have it, you better get it. Now, <laughs> factoring that in, what has been your secret weapon? So that's, that's a really great lead into this and i think and this is it's important but it's also maybe the hardest to even recognize and i always offer this up to everyone i counsel when i coach authenticity there is something very important about being yourself and showing up your whole self in this space and that's even in the midst of organizational silence trying to deal with organizational politics and with organizational culture and it blends well with what we're talking about here. So if you've already got your personal board of directors in place and you're working and monitoring this career plan, those two things should be feeding into keeping you authentic and true to self. And that's what you want. You want people around you that help you continue to ask questions and make sure this is aligned with your values. 
what's important to you in the workspace and and sometimes we don't know that going in but after you have a few experiences like the one we just the ones we described in the opening you start to recognize pretty quickly here's what i like here's what i don't like and just as wendy described in writing out your career plan you need to write out what the, what are the things i value about the work experience what are the things i value in my career and wendy knows this i have a, a thing on my vision board it's three apples and so i have the things i value in the three apples and every opportunity i take i bump up against that image if it doesn't fit on that board that means it's not aligned with the values i have in my career plan it's not aligned with the things i've shared with my personal board of directors in terms of how i want to move forward it means that's not an opportunity for me and i have tried to reshape those things and people present me with opportunities to fit on the board and if it doesn't fit with them that's fine so being very highly self-aware about what you value in a place and then adhering to those values. And so that means when we talk about issues in organizational politics and silence and people and how they respond to you and how they critique your work. So you are constantly gathering data from this experience, from your lived experience about what makes sense to you and how you feel in this space. Mm -hmm. And that helps you for a couple of reasons. One, if you are aware of your values, you've got them documented and you're constantly reviewing them, as Wendy mentioned, with your career plan, as you mentioned, Deborah, with your personal board of directors, you can then have an objective view of what's happening. Because sometimes these things we experience when it comes to politics and, and silence and negative organizational cultures, we start to doubt what's happening. We start to question ourselves, question our abilities, and we start to write a narrative that takes over, right? So everything you see is now seen through this lens of, I hate it here, or this person doesn't like me, or whatever it is. So now, if you are true to your own values and you're aware of those, you can start to look at everything objectively. So you aren't responding with this emotional response, but with a very balanced approach to that. The second thing I think is really important with that is, excuse me, it helps you get better at expressing what you feel and having more transparency. And we've already discussed that there can be some challenges around that considering the politics, but the more you are true to the, to the to yourself, which is that authenticity layer, that helps you revert back to the plan that you've been working on and the people who are holding you accountable for achieving the things on that plan. So you can start to make the types of decisions around those things that are aligned with how you value this experience and what you want from your full career, not just from this one experience. Mm -hmm. It's the whole topic of authenticity is becoming very interesting in the workplace and a little bit complicated yeah. because people hear it through a filter sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is not helpful to them in the workplace. Some people right. think it means I can just be myself oh. and say whatever I want, <laughs> anytime I want to. No. So I'm just being me. <laughs> and right. when we talk about authentic authenticity in the workplace, you have to think about the context. I'm right. in my place of work. And so what value system should I bring here that helps create a greater good for yeah. everyone. What yeah. do I do to support the culture so that it's the type of culture that feels inclusive and welcoming to everyone? What do I do to help communication? Those types of things. Mm -hmm. You know, what some studies have shown is listening skills. Yes. Very important. Showing empathy, showing consideration and giving people grace. Mm -hmm. Those are ways to demonstrate authenticity, not just say whatever you want right, to say whenever right. you want to say it. That's right. Thank you for putting the parameters around that, because when you say authentic, being authentic, that is um, that can be taken the wrong way. Yeah. Well, we're seeing that a lot more, you know, a lot of HR organizations are dealing with that when where somebody says, well, I don't, I don't value female leadership, so I'm just being me. Why should I show respect for this person? You tell me to bring my authentic self to work. Yes. This is my authentic self. Yes. Then they have to deal with that dynamic. So we yeah. always want to make sure we, we, we put it in, in context for That's people. That's kind of like wearing bias. I am biased right across your chest, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
And, the, you know, it's kind of funny, Wendy, because we actually could all wear that. We all have biases. <laughs> Absolutely. But when you do that, it creates right. a reaction. Well, which ones? Do you have the bad ones or mm -hmm. do you have the good ones? Do you have a bias <laughs> towards one. loving everybody and giving everybody a yeah. platform to be their best self? Most people, when they see that, they have a reaction to it. And you have yeah. to think about that, the context of where am I wearing my bias t-shirt? Is the workplace the best place to wear it? No, absolutely. So this has been a really interesting conversation and I hope that our listeners have some secret weapons in their toolkits now to help them as they continue to navigate their careers because that is what our goal is to impart and share wisdom with you, to celebrate you, to answer your questions so that when you leave the access point experience, you feel that it was time well spent. So I want to recap some of the high points, the takeaways that I heard from uh, the conversation today. Uh, the first one I would say is remember that your network is your net worth. Develop that personal board of directors because they will help you be successful. Understand the politics, as Wendy said, but do not get caught up in them so that you are a political, valueless person. And then lastly, as Lonnie said, be authentic. And we now know the definition of authenticity yes. <laughs> and be true to yourself. And that's what we try to bring to you every week. With Living Corporate, we have our mugs here that we celebrate together, even though we are far away. Lonnie, what libation are you partaking of today? So I stumbled upon this amazing pineapple ginger juice. Ooh. Yeah, so it's I've been killing it for the last few days. Just pineapple ginger juice? Yep. No That's gin it. in the no, juice. No gin in this juice. Just oh, Snoop Dogg would be so disappointed in you. <laughs> he would not want this cup. <laughs> <laughs> and Wendy, what about you? Hot lemon water for me. Okay, that is it. I'm so going to put I my have... bias shirt on against that one. But go ahead. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm just doing straight up hydration because I want to bring my best to the show. Yeah. So I'm just doing H2O, keeping it clean, keeping it fresh. So I'm bringing my focus to the game. I so I want to thank everyone thank for joining you. us this evening, and we hope that you will continue to tune in to the Access Point on Thursdays. We're on all the socials. Check them out. Um, I know if you've tuned in, you've seen where we are on LinkedIn, Instagram, everywhere. I won't go all through them because I know you're not writing them down. <laughs> I know you know where to find them. So until next time. To you. Be authentic and true to yourself. Get that personal board of directors. There's going to be a quiz. <laughs> and make sure that you understand politics without being political. Cheers. And we want to thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye. All right. Cheers.